everyone for joining today. Uh, so uh, I'm Teresa Quartz. I'm a pediatrician at the University of California, San Francisco, um, and along with the co-director Sohil Sud, who um, we ran this Global Child Health Lecture Series. So thank you so much for joining, as well as the Global Scholars Program for our pediatric residents. Um, and I had the distinct pleasure today of um, introducing a good friend of mine, um, for those of you who are on at the beginning of the call, who I've known since medical school, um, Dr. Anna Hedstrom. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of Washington, both in the Department of Pediatrics as well as global health, um, and she's a neonatologist. She's the medical director of, um, is it, are you still the medical director of Everett? Yeah, now, now a um, different hospital. So oh, yeah. I apologize, but medical director of one of the um, community new, um, uh, NICUs, as well as attends at the at University of Washington, and she has uh, multiple projects, um, mainly in Africa. She's worked in Uganda, Kenya, I think in Ghana now as well, um, and has done a lot in implementing bubble CPAP, um, as well as um, implementation science in NICUs broadly. So with that, and I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, yes, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you all today. Uh, and... I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. Uh, today we'll talk about um, my path and then some background, CPAP physiology and devices, oxygen blending, a path device, uh, and then implementation considerations and a device study. Um, but per uh, Teresa's request, I was just gonna start with my pathway in global health. So I was at the University of Washington for medical school where this is the most polite photo I could find, Teresa. So uh, this is uh, Dr. Quartz and I, before she was Dr. Quartz actually, uh, in medical school. Uh, and then I was at Northwestern for pediatric residency, which I think is probably for most of our audience, the stage you're all at currently, which is in um, predominantly pediatric residency training, which today I'll, I'll assume that what you're familiar with uh, is high resource neonatal intensive care. So if this looks familiar for UCSF or other hospitals you've trained at, um, this is where there's so many machines you often can't find the baby in the middle of it. Uh, babies have a lot of lines and tubes and monitors on them. And so that also is kind of what I was used to going into uh, residency and with some training in um, uh, medical school. And then during my time at Northwestern, I had a, um, global health experience, um, like you all are having, and mine was going to Mwanza, Tanzania, where I saw low resource, uh, although tertiary, but low resource neonatal intensive care, and I was really sort of puzzled to, to put together uh, how care could be delivered in places where they didn't have all of the equipment that I was getting trained with back in, in Seattle. And so when I uh, decided to pursue neonatal fellowship, I really looked for someplace where I could uh, pursue global health as my research focus in fellowship. And that at the time, and this is kind of dating myself uh, back in 2014, but that was fairly unusual. And most places uh, didn't have global health focus in neonatology. And certainly as a fellow, couldn't sort of support a fellow doing that work. Uh, but luckily being back at the University of Washington, uh, my primary mentor was Manish Batra, who um, some of you may know, and that allowed me to uh, focus on uh, global health as my research, which was made research and fellowship a lot more uh, fun. Uh, and that was in Uganda, our clinical site that we'll, we'll discuss more. Uh, and uh, then I was able to become faculty at the University of Washington, where you know overall over my career so far, I've expanded to many different sites um, beyond uh, Uganda. And, and many of them, uh, you know, Ghana and Ethiopia and Kenya are some places I actually haven't been, uh, but especially with the help of COVID, I feel like we've really developed ways uh, of working remotely. And so it's much more feasible to be very involved with global health and not actually um, spend a lot of time in the sites. And sometimes that actually makes it more appropriate. Uh, so my job as a neonatal faculty, I feel like sometimes when you're in training, you don't hear a lot about what it would be like to end up in a career uh, in academic global health. So to give you a little tidbit of that, I'm a clinician educator at the University of Washington, which means uh, there's, there's uh, full-time research or uh, um, physician scientists that do predominantly research, typically funded by fairly large NIH studies and have 
a small amount of clinical time. On the other end of the spectrum, there are full-time clinical faculty that do predominantly clinical work and have a little bit of other side um, uh, engagements. And then in the middle uh, is something, something like a clinician educator. And there's similar tracks at different academic sites throughout the US. Uh, and that's where it's somewhat of a 50-50 mix. Uh, and so um, my percent time allotment, uh, if it was to be believed in a pie chart, would mean that, a, that um, something around 40% of my time is uh, clinical. So I, I um, largely attend at Seattle Children's, uh, which is you know, a tertiary referral surgical unit. Um, I teach fellows and residents, some of medical students. This picture was a day on rounds where we ended before noon and a parent randomly brought us a bucket of snacks. So pretty much the best day ever on a fellowship uh, rotation um, at that hospital. I also have a little bit of my time sort of administrative. So my case, um, as Dr. Quartz mentioned, I um, help neonatal medical direct a community site and do lots of teaching. Um, generally, mostly write a whole lot of emails during this time, which then leaves the rest of my time for scholarly work. Uh, and that's distributed among many different projects. We're talking about sort of one of them today uh, on CPAP work. Uh, and uh, one thing I find really fortunate about the position I ended up in is the University of Washington has a lot of global health faculty. So a lot of people who that's their primary focus for research, which uh, at least in neonatology is fairly unusual. So there's about eight faculty that do global health at uh, University of Washington. And so it's uh, really a nice environment where I get to collaborate with colleagues and help sort of productivity and uh, networking. And so um, those are things that have, I think, made me successful overall. So that's my background. Okay, so now to our meat of our talk. By the way, as I go, feel free to stop me for questions is fine. If you put it in the chat, I will probably see it because I've got that pulled up. Uh, or save it to the end. You have a long day of lecture, I'm noticing by looking at your schedule. So if I can talk at an appropriate speed, <laughs> hopefully there'll be time at the end where you can ask me questions or go, you know, get lunch or walk your dogs or whatever it is. So, well, I'd rather spend time on your questions than droning on about slides. So feel free uh, to whatever is useful. Okay. Uh, so I know you've had talks about the global burden of childhood disease uh, and causes of death uh, earlier in this pathway. Uh, it's a pretty easy sell to show that neonatal uh, causes of deaths rank very highly among um, causes of death, not just among the under five population, but even among all, uh, all people. This is the disability associated life years that come out of the IHME. Uh, and you see that neonatal causes of uh, disease actually attribute to one of the biggest boxes of disability associated life years. And so this is a, uh, easy to say as a neonatologist, but clearly an area of, of focus. Uh, globally, over the last 30 years, there have been big improvements in under five mortality, um, especially in areas of things that affect children. Uh, so pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria treatments. And so there's been very good improvements in under five mortality, but uh, less improvements in neonatal mortality rates and such, such that now neonatal causes of death is almost 50%. So in that first month of life is almost all of the death that the under five group sees. Um, and uh, that has shown to be a... a stickier area for improvements in mortality over time. Uh, to the point um, that the global targets for mortality that they hoped to reach by 2030, which is not as far away as it sounded several years ago, are would be the dotted line on the bottom with the stars on it. And if we're continuing at more of our current rates of decline, we won't hit those global targets for neonatal mortality rate. So when we think about that in, uh, in global health, what we then think about is, well, you know, wh what should we be targeting to improve it um, beyond this? And uh, the, the first question to ask is kind of, you know, who, what, when, where, and why for these deaths? 
So this is not a surprising graph or, or excuse me, um, map to anyone in this group, but you see that the neonatal mortality rates in the Southern hemisphere far outstrip those in the Northern hemisphere. And in particular, Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Africa have by far the highest mortality rates. And also these and South Asia have some of the uh, highest populations, meaning the actual number of neonatal deaths is um, greatest in these areas. So that is uh, predominantly where you know, my focus has been in work uh, is in the Sub-Saharan African region. Within neonatal deaths, uh, causes, the, the primary cause of neonatal death is, is due to prematurity. So um, both babies who are born very early and can't initially breathe or resuscitate uh, and die, and babies who that suffer complications of being born preterm and die over the course of a hospitalization or even right after they get home. Other things significantly are infection and birth asphyxia as well. Uh, but causes of uh, preterm um, death due to prematurity is uh, a big area of focus. And as far as a single disease is probably the biggest um, thing we can focus on for under five mortality. Um, so for uh, when we think about what it is that's difficult to survive with in, in prematurity, there's many factors, but I think a lot of us have seen uh, this type of uh, distress present in a newborn, especially, a, for example, a premature baby. And so when looking at this patient, I think the things that jump out to you is lethargy, um, you know, concerns for a septic picture, low blood sugars, uh, poor nutrition, but also the respiratory distress. So this is a baby who was born early and is having breathing with their belly, their uh, sucking in below their ribs, between their ribs, intercostal retractions, um, some amount of nasal flaring. And so this is a baby in respiratory failure. And as you all know from your time in the neonatal intensive care units, the, the struggle that preterm babies have is their alveoli collapse um, and need to be reopened with every breath. And so that takes a lot of work to do. It also makes them um, unable to oxygenate well enough, unable to ventilate well enough, and it can really um, wear them out as far as their breathing over time. So the treatment uh, universally for premature respiratory distress is a continuous positive airway pressure. Um, we won't really cover high flow nasal cannula today. Uh, in general, it's not well established within our premature babies to um, be uh, as effective as continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. And so bubble continuous, uh, bubble CPAP has a very simple um, uh, setup. What you need is on the left here, a source of flow. So this is uh, in your units is probably from the wall a source of oxygen, you can use a concentrator or a tank. So you have a, a source of flow that then needs to be administered to the baby's nose. There's different contraptions for that. And then an expiratory limb goes underwater. And that's really all it takes to have a bubble CPAP circuit. Uh, and so what is it that bubble CPAP does for a preterm baby? So this next figure is of a rabbit lung, not a, not a baby lung. Uh, connected to a ventilator. And so with each breath, you see the lungs inflate and then deflate. And so this is similar to what happened to a preterm baby. When they add continuous positive airway pressure, the lungs don't deflate. And instead they continue to optimally inflate and stay that way between breaths. And then when they take away the CPAP, you'll see the lungs will deflate again between breaths. And so that provision of continuous positive airway pressure in a premature baby is what helps keep their lungs open, oxygenates and ventilates and reduces the work of breathing. Uh, in continuous, in bubble CPAP, the depth of the tube underwater in centimeters is the amount of CPAP. So a baby on the left would be on five centimeters water pressure of CPAP because that's how far the tube is under. 
And then if you pushed it farther into six centimeters, now you've increased the baby's CPAP to six. Uh, the bubble part of um, this comes because the air bubbles out the bottom of the tube. And instead of a continuous flow of um, air, like you would get if you connected just to a ventilator in your unit, it actually has bubbling and that creates oscillations of pressure to the baby's lungs that transmit back. And it's a little bit like being on an oscillator. And what we've seen is that babies using bubble CPAP have a little bit less failure with their CPAP. And so that's considered the optimal way to administer CPAP. It's also simpler. Uh, and so high resource units in the US uh, have gone back to using bubble CPAP because it's considered more effective than flow driven CPAP, like if you just hook a baby to the ventilator. So that's why today we're mostly talking about bubble CPAP. I won't belabor the evidence for this. Um, in general, this was the Cochrane review from 2020 of comparing CPAP in preterm babies to just giving them oxygen uh, with the, the outcome of interest being death or needing to be ventilated, intubated. And you can see that overall at the bottom here, the uh, it favors CPAP um, about, point, about 0.7 for the risk ratio. Um, and that's well accepted. You'll notice that this is not including a lot of studies or a lot of subjects. So the high resource setting here, there's four studies, most of them are from the 70s. And then low resource settings, there is one study and a total number of patients here of about like 300 patients combined. So this is a puny amount of subjects, but it's so well accepted, there's no equipoise to do these randomized studies. And so it's, it's a little bit on the spectrum of like testing a parachute to jump out of an airplane that people don't really do randomized trials, certainly not in high resource settings to not give CPAP to premature babies. <clears throat> Uh, so we know that CPAP is good for babies, uh, and we know that globally we need to help survival in low resource areas. The Every Newborn Action Plan is the way the world has come together to kind of respond to newborn mortality and, and make goals. And that was most recently done in 2020 again, and they, they produced coverage targets. So they sort of take the sustainable development goals, I'm sure you've heard about, and translate them into like newborn action plans. And part of this uh, that, of course, I focus on is the goal for 80% of districts to have uh, at least one facility that can care for small and sick newborns, and that includes CPAP. So one district is a pretty large area. I, I'm, you know, in this San Francisco metro area, that might be the whole city, for example, would have one facility that could that could uh, care for a baby with CPAP. And so that's the goal globally is to get up to that uh, place. And so people who maybe aren't familiar with implementation in low resource settings would see this as a very clear uh, need to distribute devices globally. And so, uh, you know, one of the ways to think about this is, well, great, we will, you know, just you know, airlift CPAP devices throughout the world and make sure that every district has a couple and no problem will reduce newborn mortality. And I think um, those of us in this uh, group can appreciate just off the cuff why that isn't an uh, adequate strategy to improve uh, newborn outcomes by doing that. Uh, because there's a lot of things to consider before you initiate bubble CPAP therapy in a facility. Uh, facilities generally need electricity to run CPAP, continuous electricity. So not something where, where it goes in and out throughout the day or a baby would be left un unsupported. In capital letters here is the staff needed to administer bubble CPAP. And we'll talk a lot more about that. They need an oxygen source. Globally, oxygen is very limited and the COVID pandemic has made that even worse. They generally need pulse oximetry too to in order to titrate oxygen like we will discuss. Those machines are also expensive. They need the bubble CPAP devices themselves that we'll talk about. And then the devices themselves need to be have replacement parts and be serviceable. If you've traveled places, low resource places providing intensive care, you will probably have found a graveyard of devices against a wall in a back room, uh, very expensive things that have been donated 
but can't be fixed because they're missing a spark plug or the engineer isn't available who knows how to work them or they were made in 1980 in the US and you know they're no longer able to be working or in some of these sites. Then you need training and guidelines to be able to use these things safely. And lastly, you need staff and parents to really believe in the effectiveness of this uh, device. And the other consideration that I think this group um, knows as well is to know that bubble CPAP, while very effective and life-saving, isn't definitive therapy that will save all newborns. So there are babies for whom CPAP is not enough and they need a higher level of care. So mechanical ventilation and or surfactant are the higher levels of care. And so not all babies will be saved by just bubble CPAP. So this device, although a fuzzy picture, might look a little familiar from what you have used in your units recently. And this is a fisher Pickel bubble CPAP circuit. Uh, and this is what we are used to. It has about something like $100 of disposable parts for every kid who goes on CPAP. So we know, we, you, know you and your intern sit at the baby, sit at the bedside of a 33 week kid who's kind of grunting and you're like, ah, put on some CPAP. You, they literally go and open packages that uh, have that much equipment that they're then gonna throw away as soon as the kid doesn't use the CPAP or is done with the CPAP. The device itself, and this is the cheapest you can get is around 6,000 US dollars for bubble CPAP. And you know, our units have many of these devices. So it's obvious to say that that is not a price tag that most low resource facilities uh, can use to deliver CPAP to their babies. And so as CPAP became obvious as the answer to better treat newborn respiratory distress, um, back in about 2015, the WHO condoned use of uh, improvised bubble CPAP. So they, they showed a um, device that was initially designed or published by Duke in 2015, uh, the person, not the institution. And it uses a simple nasal cannula. So just an oxygen nasal cannula, like you might use to you know, give a, a, someone a half liter of flow. What they do, you can see in this figure, is they cut one limb of the tubing and clamp it. And so the oxygen comes from the source, the prongs go to the baby, and then they've now created an expiratory limb and that goes and gets submerged in water. And so you see how that creates the, the uh, form that we look for in the mechanisms of CPAP. And so this has been published and also, you know, um, discovered globally from all these sites that can't afford that $6,000 CPAP for all their babies who need uh, treatment. And so my colleagues at uh, PATH, when they traveled looking at devices, they came up with this photo montage of some of the ways they've seen this device created in other countries. <laughs> Excuse me. So these are um, units predominantly in India, but you can see that places take the cannula to the baby and then find different ways to create the expiratory limb jar, um, often with, with tape. Um, these are soda bottles. Um, they may or may not have uh, air exit ports meaning the pressure could build up in them. The diameter of tubing varies widely. So some of these, this is at the top left is IV tubing, it has a very narrow bore. Bottom right is some sort of respiratory nebulized tubing. It has a very wide, wide bore and pressure varies greatly by the radius of how you're delivering it. Length of tubing varies. So you can imagine all of these different circuits have different performance abilities to actually deliver pressure to the baby's nares. <clears throat> However, this is what people are using because this is what they have access to. These devices can generally be assembled for about four US dollars. <clears throat> and when, when, when we discuss this in this conference, I'll tell you about later, to all these East African providers, people showed us their design and said it cost $4. And we just thought that was amazing that someone could provide CPAP for that cost. And someone raised their hand right away and said, okay, 
where do you get the four dollars? And and that was that was the comment that even that amount of money is a uh, tangible ex expense for families who are asked to provide that. And so in response, they oft often reuse these devices. So literally put them in bleach, uh, try and pull the tape off and then reuse them for the next baby because it's that or nothing, right? And so all of these attempts are valiant attempts to save newborn lives, but using equipment that's really unideal for what the baby needs. So that's the spectrum of devices. Uh, and there has been improvement in devices made for low resource settings. This is called a, the Pumani device that Rice University made uh, and is widely in use in particular Malawi. And it has a lot of really important features, more reliable pressure delivery. There's a few things it doesn't have, um, but can be has been shown to be highly effective. And it has a price tag of, of around $900. So, Again, it's much less than the 6,000, but functionally the way this is actually going in Malawi for the most part is units have a couple of these devices for two babies at a time, if they're both working. And then the other babies who need CPAP end up with a $4 device with a fully improvised device. And so um, there, there's still a need for something that is more tested and reliable but uh, isn't as expensive as these $400 devices or $900 devices. And estimates are that about almost 900,000 babies per year in just sort of sub-Saharan Africa would be eligible or benefit from CPAP treatment each year. And so it's a really huge market that could benefit from devices. And so the problem number one we talked about today is that we don't have enough CPAP devices for the babies who need them. Okay, does anybody know who this is? If so, you can say it or drop it in the chat. Any guesses? I think as my audience gets younger over the years, less people know who this is. I mean, Honestly, it's Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Stevie Wonder, very good. Yes, Stevie Wonder. Um, so Stevie Wonder was a premature baby. He, I think he was 32 weeks, 34 weeks gestation in the 1940s. And that is around the time when the US where we started caring for premature babies. That was sort of the era of the Coney Island preterm baby shows. And they started figuring out what it took to, to take care of babies born early. And of course, 34 weeks these days, we consider not, a, not all that significantly premature. But one thing that made them look great was using oxygen. And so Stevie Wonder was treated with 100% oxygen and developed retinopathy of prematurity, uh, which made him blind. So over development and growth of the blood vessels in the back of his eye during the crucial development periods of a preterm baby, um, made him blind. And so there's a lot of mimics to things that were done in sort of high resource Western places a generation or two ago that are now playing out in other parts of the world where they're just now being able to care for babies who were born early, like, like we could back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And so there's a second epidemic of blindness that's coming towards uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and has already hit uh, India and South Asia to more of an extent because there's care for premature babies and including oxygen use, but not the things that came later, such as titration of oxygen. So we know that oxygen is harmful for the eyes. It can hurt the lungs and hurt the brain. So 100% oxygen is bad. It's, it gives you free radicals. And so the answer is to keep babies, instead of saturating 100%, to only use the oxygen you need to saturate something like the low 90s. To do that right now in your NICUs, there's, there's a nurse standing by a baby's bedside and they're going like 22%, 21%. And then they wait and then they go 22% and then they wait. And then if they need to, they go 23%. And that's the level of care and attention that's addressed to 
making sure babies receive the lowest percent of oxygen necessary. And they're using an oxygen blender. These blenders require flow from a wall, which is a very high pressure source that you don't have in most low resource settings. And they also cost about $1,600. This is what Google told me at least for this one. So they're very expensive. And so that is not a functional way to, to titrate oxygen delivery to a baby in most of these settings. And so our second problem besides not having enough CPAP devices is not having a way to safely deliver oxygen to these premature babies. And that we're risking them surviving like Stevie Wonder did, but being blind from the oxygen therapy. Um, surveys in Sub-Saharan Africa would say maybe 1% of units have the ability to blend oxygen. So by and large, it is not occurring in these sites that still have the higher level of care because they might have CPAP available. So now we've learned our two problems and then I'm gonna tell you kind of how we've worked towards these. Uh, PATH is a nonprofit in Seattle. <laughs> it's a development uh, tech, sort of tech incubator to solve uh, problems for low resource settings. Their big claims to fame have been things like patches to deliver vaccines, vaccinations that don't require refrigeration or have a little patch on them to make sure you know if they're spoiled and weren't properly refrigerated. So PATH does a lot of really neat things. And it's one of the fun things about being in Seattle is a lot of these global um, health organizations are here. And so my colleagues at PATH started working on this problem, um, uh, engineers, uh, to, to solve both the CPAP device and the oxygen blending. And this has been one of those fun things about being in global health and being a clinician is they come to us with their ideas and what they've come up with so far. And then we add the clinical insight <clears throat> to make it appropriate for babies to talk about how we actually care for babies, what parameters we use, what would work, what wouldn't work. And so we kind of work together on designs. Uh, and uh, the other big step with this was running a CPAP conference in East Africa, where we brought together providers who were using um, generally improvised CPAP and, and really flushed out as a group what things that were useful at the bedside in these settings. So again, places where you didn't have the wall oxygen, where you don't have um, respiratory therapists and um, you know, x-rays and blood gases and all these things, what do you actually need to, to use a CPAP device? So this group all put in sort of parameters uh, together and uh, Pat came up with the initial designs for a device that isn't particularly um, rocket science, if you will. Uh, the, the device, um, uses a ram cannula as an interface for the baby's nose, which depending on how your neonatologists think you may or may not use in your units, because uh, it, it doesn't have an occlusive interface. But basically what we found is it's um, easier to keep the nose from breaking down and easier to maintain in the patient to nurse ratios that you typically see in low resource settings. Uh, so that's the interface that it uses. And then it's really just uh, standardized tubing um, and a tube and a bottle all of which has been tested for pressure delivery <clears throat> and then a bubbler stand because um, the uh, conference really showed that people needed a way to keep the bottle upright. Uh, and so it'd be fun, you'd then go to you know, PATH the next week and they would show you the latest design and how they hooked it up and we would talk about <clears throat> you know, the parameters and how we would um, use this in settings. Uh, and so now there's some progress towards that first thing, which is devices that are more affordable. This device is probably around to actually manufacture it. It's probably around 20 US dollars. It's not on the market yet. I'll tell you where we are with it, but, but things always end up being more expensive than you think. So um, e either way, it's well below the $900 um, mark from before. And as you can tell too, this, design, this uh, device although it will never be marketed this way, could be cleaned and reused, which is what it actually happens in these settings, as opposed to um, the commercialized devices that aren't always cleanable. And so now we still have that second problem, which is uh, how do we uh, provide blended oxygen to babies? Uh, so the other part of past design was an oxygen blender, uh, which uses a Venturi technique so if you notice the bottom left, these are Venturi blenders you've seen at the bottom oxygen masks on adults. 
And so different colors or different percents, depending on what percent oxygen you want to give them. And this that's the same technique designed to make this blender that they've, they've created. And so what happens is it's hooked up to 100% oxygen source, which is what low resource settings tend to have, a tank or an oxygen concentrator, 100% oxygen. And that goes into the blender. And then there's a hole and a gap it jumps across and it pulls in room air and mixes it. And so what comes out the other end is a blend. So instead of 100% gas, it's less than 100%, but it's still at pressure because you still need the pressure to run your CPAP. Uh, so they mocked up this de design and again you go to their lab and they would like you know have 3D printed the latest version of it um, to be to start testing. Um, and you know our team would get together and Dr. James at the bottom right is our colleague from Uganda who would come to Seattle and you know look at it and tell us what concerns they had, what things seemed like it would or wouldn't be good about this design. <clears throat> uh, and putting these things together, um, this is now the, the PATH CPAP device. So it's the concoction of tubes we saw at the top left. And then this blender, this is kind of the final design right there. Um, and there's two blenders. So two different blends they've created. Uh, it's about this big. Uh, one that makes 60% uh, oxygen and one that makes 37%. And so that's the, the two blends that I've made so far, excuse me. And they go right in line. So right from the oxygen source you put it in line and then it goes to the baby. And so now we have progress towards problem two as well, which is the ability to blend oxygen and air. And then overall the device characteristics, um, you know, we have something that can run, this actual device itself doesn't require electricity to run because you could use it off of a tank. Um, the, you can blend, it runs at the, the pressure that newborns tend to need, it, it runs at the flows of oxygen that you tend to be able to get from a concentrator, which is what people tend to have at the bedside. Um, and so that's sort of the final de device 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 design, excuse me. Sorry, Anna. Um, Josh has a yeah. question in the chat. And Josh, I don't know, do you want to come off mute? Oh, hey. Oh, yeah. Hey, Josh. It is. Oh, he's, oh, he's with kids. OK, so <laughs> um, yes, Josh, so this is the same blending device as the Bayou device, the same mechanism. The Vayu device, I don't have a picture of it in here. Uh, it has, they did this in a little rotating so they can switch between different blends. Um, they have a filter in the circuit coming from the air source. And they use a different type of nasal interface for the Vayu device called a Hudson prong, which if you've seen it, it looks like a, a a clear rod, oh, thank you, Teresa. A, a clear tube under the nose and goes up and gets secured by safety pins under the nose, which has uh, improved pressure delivery, but sort of different uh, requirements for, for maintaining it at the bedside, the actual affixation to the baby. So similar, the value price point will be higher because of sort of the, those features we discussed. Uh, also not on the market yet, but probably in the low hundreds of dollars. Uh, is is the other price point different? Uh, I'm happy to talk more about that too, Josh. I have a, a slide at the very end too. We can I can add on if we have uh, time. <clears throat> okay, so um, when thinking about this device, now we need to think. Okay, well, is this actually going to work? You know, is this something that would be useful to people? So, uh, Chuoko Hospital is in central Uganda. It's a very rural area. People tend to be farmers. Um, uh, high neonatal mortality rate. This hospital itself functions as a referral center because it's a center of excellence and has really developed over the years. Uh, it's used, Adara Development is a group out of Australia that sort of um, supported the um, facility over the years and provided funding for a lot of things. Uh, so this is in general uh, um, a well-functioning neonatal unit in an area that has pretty high neonatal mortality rates. Um, continuous electricity, about over a thousand emissions a year, but still the limitations you'd expect from a low resource area. They don't have surfactant, they don't have TPN, they don't have fortified feeds largely. Um, all the um, you know feeds and diapering is done by moms who are in the unit every three hours. 
Um, so still sort of care limitations um, for babies. So this is the site that I started working at as a fellow um, and was, and that was back in 2012, about 10 years ago. And at that time, this site and Dr. James, who our colleague I showed you earlier, knew that they weren't using CPAP for babies. And that was something they were talking about um, expanding into the use of CPAP for babies, because otherwise they just had oxygen nasal cannulas. And so for this group, I think it's worth thinking about when would you put a device, when, when would a, a unit start using a new device or a new level of technology? <clears throat> and some of the things we think about with a nursery being ready for CPAP is, are the basics for neonatal care able to be uh, done at a unit? Because adding CPAP to a baby who is cold or not fed or needs antibiotics, uh, or has low blood sugar, all those things aren't gonna be effective to actually save their life. And so there's levels of neonatal care that kind of guide which units would, would expand into uh, CPAP. Uh, but those are all things we, we think about um, when, when units uh, are considering expanding to CPAP. Then there's also consideration of, is introduction of CPAP the right thing to do? So just because you could add in a device. The other question is, should you? <clears throat> so a big consideration here is staffing. Anytime you add in a new device that has complexity, you are um, you run the risk of sucking resources into the use of that device for a small number of babies. So the average nurse has about 10 babies to take care of in these settings. Your own NICU, I can assure you, they probably take care of about two babies. One if they're very complex and maybe three if they're doing okay. And so if you can imagine, if you gave any one of your nurses 10 kids to manage, their attention is very divided. And if you give them one kid now who has CPAP on and has to take a lot of effort to maintain the CPAP and suction and position and change oxygen levels, it's possible that their other nine babies aren't gonna get the care they need. And triage of care is a, is a real, real situation in these settings. So there's always a possibility that you're making care worse for nine out of 10 kids by adding that super uh, intense therapy for the one kid whose survival chance was low before. <clears throat> you're gonna need to train all of the staff. The staff has high turnover rates usually uh, and so you'll need to retrain months later and there needs to be a plan for that. There needs to be thoughts for safety. What do you do if a baby gets a pneumothorax, for example? Uh, can you treat that? Um, and so these are all the considerations that Chuoka was thinking for about if they wanted to add in CPAP to what they were, to what they were doing. Uh, and when I was there as a fellow, uh, these improvised devices were now becoming common and we took a improvised device from Seattle <coughs> to kind of help this discussion as they were considering CPAP. And after we had this entire discussion of all these pros and cons and it just wasn't clear if Joko wanted to actually go through with using CPAP, my colleague Dr. James turned around and said, well that baby will die if they don't have CPAP. And so this is a 31 week premature infant who is an incubator. Uh, and as you can see, her breathing is a little bit irregular. She's sucking in between her ribs. She's using her belly to breathe. She looks poorly nourished. She has some nasal flaring and she's puffing out her cheeks with every breath. <clears throat> and she'd been doing this for two days. And so Dr. James said, this baby needs CPAP. And as a fellow at this time, you know, early in my global health experience, and luckily not being a leader in the room at that time, I sort of sat in the corner with my eyes giant and sweating and trying to decide like, is this, you know, wh where does this fit in the rubric of what, you know, should be done academically versus what, what the staff wants to do for this baby. And so ultimately Dr. James and Sister Christine, so the um, nurses uh, often in Sub-Saharan Africa go by the term sister, 
uh, and uh, Sister Christine was in charge for that unit. And you've all been in NICUs enough to know that the in charge is essentially the one who's actually running the unit. And so Dr. James and Sister Christine used the device uh, and put it on this baby. You can see it's made with the Nalgene bottle because it came from Seattle. So as the CPAP got going, you this little baby just started to move and wiggle and her breathing got better. She slowed down and it saved her life. So she stayed on CPAP a handful more days and then came off of it and eventually went home. And so all of a sudden now we had CPAP implemented in a unit where it really hadn't been the plan 12 hours before that. Uh, a note about nurses that I think we often don't, aren't trained for with, you know, Western uh, pediatric training is these units run on nurses. Doctors are very hard to come by. They're very spread out. They don't have the ability to be in units all of the time. And so nurses, especially in neonatal care, are the ones who are delivering care, deciding on care, triaging, making things actually run. <clears throat> and so when you think about implementing CPAP, you really have to be focused on what it takes to deliver this care via the nurses. And so in the case back in 2012, the answer was I sat by that kid's bed while we tried to all of a sudden uh, fire hose educate the whole unit about use of CPAP, uh, including things like how to place an orogastric tube because nobody knew how to do that, how to weigh a baby, how to feed them with CPAP. And obviously this is not the way to implement CPAP in a unit. But then the question is how, what is the best way to implement it? And what does it take and what's feasible? And so fast forward when we had this new device in this last year or two, we uh, used Shwoop as our site to study the feasibility and usability of this device. And so this is with the Saving Lives at Birth grant. So it's early feasibility study uh, where we collected device on the babies and also the nursing experience, because again, is this feasible in their workload to implement this type of device? Uh, as all stories go in the last few years, this was during COVID and so um, myself, my teammates in Seattle couldn't go to administer any of this. And so this was all done remotely. And as often more stories go in COVID, that really is the way to do it anyways. It just took more work and innovation. So all the training, figuring out how to blend oxygen and collect data, all those things happened remotely for, you know, using our the staff at Choco and the, the team members who are on site. And so 14 babies, uh, as part of this early feasibility study went on the device. Um, uh, most were uh, treated because of prematurity and they weighed a median weeks of gestation of 31 weeks. Um, and let's see, um, you know, nurses, all the people on the right here are working together to administer care and try, try this new therapy. Um, the doctor team as well supported it on the left. Um, the, you know, the blenders this is the first time this is being used in babies. So the nurses are figuring out how hard it is to switch out these blenders. How, you know, is this something they can do? How long does that take? Does the baby decompensate? Uh, which blenders are necessary? And what we found is that most babies needed a 37% oxygen blender, as you would expect. The average on CPAP was about three days. Two deaths occurred. Um, which is actually a little below average mortality on CPAP in the unit. Again, this is without ventilation, mechanical ventilators or transfer really for higher levels of care. <clears throat> babies were hypoxic, so hyperoxic, excuse me. So 37% oxygen is still too high for some babies. And so it was clear that um, without the ability to go below 37%, babies still would have a little too much oxygen, but they weren't on the 100% that used to have been the standard of care. And there was no other uh, adverse events reported. Um, uh, setting up the device took 15 minutes for a nurse to do. 
changing of the blender, as you just saw the nurse doing the video, took about 15 seconds. Uh, and nurses were overall satisfied nine out of 10 <coughs> satisfaction with the device. We learned things about the device. Um, the, it really doesn't take much flow to run on, which is good. Uh, it's noisy, it's significantly noisy. Uh, and then we just needed to label some things more clearly. So all things you learn from doing this type of trial. Uh, the team in general felt like this was a pretty simple de design. They thought it was easy to use. They would like a blender less than 37%, which is a currently a device limitation for this and sort of the value. When you would train room air, you drop the pressure. And so if you would try and train enough room air to get your percent oxygen below 37%, you might not have the pressure needed to run the, to run the device. So that's a, that's a significant consideration for this type of device. And in general, nurses felt like it gave less oxygen to the baby, and we know the disadvantages of giving too much oxygen. So the nurses felt satisfied with the idea that they were able to give better care to the babies by using this device than they had before where they really didn't have uh, sufficient oxygen blending capacity. So we conclude that this type of device is feasible um, to use in places where otherwise they would be using 100% oxygen for babies, and that you know using it may decrease the risk of morbidity from oxygen toxicity in neonates. <clears throat> so next step for this device in general is commercialization partners, right? Who's going to manufacture it? Um, FDA approval is usually something that facilitates these things getting on distribution lists for uh, global supply chains. Um, and then, and then, really, the other big thing is studying implementation in device in settings that haven't already used CPAP. So, taking a really CPAP naive site and um, studying what it takes to implement it there. Um, and the collaborators on this work um, again: uh, Chihuahua Hospital, Adara Development, Path, University of Washington, and then Macquarie University in Uganda. This is the slide I found, so I had to include it because I thought it was. A low point with my first kid. <laughs> Apparently, if you're going to put them in a pumpkin, you got to bring the pumpkin in the night before. Otherwise, it's a very cold pumpkin. So that's what we learned. <clears throat> All right. I hopefully hit it with enough time to answer any questions. If if that was a low point of parenting, I think you are really <laughs> <laughs> one of many. But you know, who have kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Anna. Um, it's just really incredible to see um, all the work you've done across the spectrum from development of a device to implementation um, and the research and feasibility um, goes into it is really helpful to see that full spectrum. Um, a quick note, and then I'll open it up to questions for the group. Um, Tiffany has dropped in the chat a, an evaluation link. It has just three or four questions on it, super short, but we do really appreciate your feedback. Um, and we do incorporate it into our future sessions. So please take a moment and fill that out. And um, I will stop talking and see if um, anyone has any questions. Question for you. Thanks for the great talk. My question is about Kiwoko itself. You know, we have experience doing CPAP in Eastern Congo and it was successful, but the lesson I took from it was this was reflective of the uniqueness of the site. Can you talk about maybe the relationship with the Adara group and whether this is truly generalizable? Yeah, yeah. I I have the same question myself. Um, currently I'm <clears throat> working in Ghana at different sites as well. And each site has its own things to consider. Um, you know, I think that the education is probably the biggest component for these sites, um, to take a truly, truly CPAP naive site <clears throat> and train it requires not just that, you know, day or two of, um, curriculum in a classroom, but then also the reinforcement. And, um, I, you know, I think we're all familiar with what it takes to implement things in our own sites as well, but, uh, to me, it's more about the ongoing mentorship of a site to be able to support it, you know, which is what happens for you all when you use a new CRT machine or something. It's like literally that, that support person who pops up at the bedside and helps you troubleshoot it. And I, I think that's a big consideration for anywhere. And that's sort of one of the other hats I wear is just considering how to do that type of implementation and really making nurse champions, I think is the, the only feasible way to support that in most sites. Because the way to support it isn't to fly me in from Seattle uh, to support it.
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Fritz. Yes, I have a question. I'm currently working with a hospital in Haiti. They want to implement uh, CPAP, but I'm interested about the device you showed with the 37 and 60 person, the blender. How can we find it? <laughs> that is um, the, the best question, uh, Fritz, which is when can this be purchased, right? When can you get it from a, a supply? And that's the next steps, really. You know, um, uh, Joshua mentioned uh, the value device that probably will get, will get to the market soon and with a higher price point. Um, but getting this one out there is sort of the next step in the process, and each step is its own hurdle. Um, and so the the answer right now is it's not it's not purchasable, and there's not an immediate stage for it to be purchasable. But that's what we're working towards because it's a huge gap um, right now. I was uh, looking about the straw you put on the bottle to have the pressure, but we use this one with what we can add water in it to have the pressure. I don't know if you see the difference. The one can you, you show, rephrase that, the what I put on the bottle? You show something, uh, the, the straw had to go deep, deeper to have the pressure, but the one we use, we add, we add water to have the pressure. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that would work too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you just need the the whole point is how deep underwater the bubbles are coming out. So you can either advance the tube or raise the water level. Um, so either one could could work and you have to maintain the water level because it'll evaporate over time. Yep. Thank Absolutely. you. Oh, sorry, Josh, go ahead. So I, I have another question off. for you. I, I myself sure. work in devices. And if I had to say like a criticism of our own work, I would say it's like device oriented. And you brought up nurse turnover. And I wonder if just your own opinion, are we missing like some big thing by not trying to address nurse turnover? You know, one of the things I have observed in the field is that people turn over, but then they are actually replaced. So it's actually more of a rotation by design than it is a mm -hmm. true gap. And by simply stopping this, could you suddenly develop some expertise in like handling preterm babies? And are we missing something big here that could be pretty low cost? Um, yes, it is that big of a thing. And there's more and more attention to it. But it's also there are some really fundamental, um, I guess, I mean, cultural or things about the rotation that's actually um, desired by nurses to rotate and is considered makes you a more valuable nurse. So uh, I, nurse specialization in certain fields would be really helpful, but right now there's nothing to you know accredit them or pay them more or, or um, uh, make that desirable is to specialize in neonatal nursing. And, and, that, and they're working on that, that sort of curriculum and such, but it is a huge issue. Um, in Ghana, we'll train NRP and show up six months later, and half of those nurses are gone. And it it is a it's a huge brain drain that happens continually. That's a good segue. My question is about sustainability of all of these things that we're trying to implement in various ways. And it seems like, you know, education is one, staff turnover, but any other insights from your work? And this is great in terms of how do we implement it, but how do we keep it actually going? Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of these things end up, and, and the part of the work that maybe I'm not as attracted to, but is really important is the policy work and getting ministries of health to, to fund these things with the limited budgets they have. Um, but really, these things don't take off until there's ministry funding to, you know, replace the cannulas when they get when they get hard, and to expect the newborn mortality can actually be as improved. And and that's all improving. But that's really what it takes, as opposed to like this micro work on certain each facility. It needs to be um, uh, more universal. And and it's a tough sell. It takes time, but it is heading in that direction. I think. Okay, any other last minute questions? How to find more information if you have a site or something you can share? I put yeah. path.org in there. I don't know if there's something else as well as the Department yeah. of Global Health from University of Washington. Yeah, I'm putting my email in the chat. Okay. Um, 
that is, uh, and we have a publication. Depend, it kind of depends what you want for it. So feel free to email me and I can hone into what you're looking for. We have some publications in different stages of coming out, but if um, I'm happy to kind of loop you in with what is most helpful if you email me, which I just put in the chat. This is Headstrom? Yes, yep, Headstrom at uw.edu. Like Josh and Anna, you guys should <laughs> compare notes. And yeah, see if there's uh, some opportunity for so. collaboration here. I think so. I'll send him a, a message here too. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anna. Really amazing. It's great to see um, really from the development science piece all the way to the implementation and the outcomes. It's just a really impressive, um, impressive work. So thank you so much for sharing with us and spending time. And for the residents on the call, we have um, a 45 minute break now, and then uh, we'll